This work is funded in part with money from the Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund that was created with the vote of the people of Minnesota on November 4, 2008. Why you wanna fly, blackbird? You ain't never gonna fly. Vili ya kosa ya, me no. Ko yeng ya chita. The Vietnam War in the United States, also known as the Second Indochina War in Vietnam, referred to as the American War, aka the Resistance War Against America, aka a Cold War Era Proxy War. Its definition, two separate powers utilizing external strife to somehow attack the interests or territorial holdings of the other frequently involving both countries fighting their opponent's allies or assisting their allies in fighting their opponent, aka the Laotian Civil War. The Royal Lao government versus the Patai Lao with the help of the Cold War superpowers, the Soviet Union, China, North Vietnam, America, South Vietnam, the American CIA recruit a group of people from the mountain tops of northern Laos called the Hmong to aid in the fight against communism. 1953 to 1975, the secret war. An event in history, an event some of us have no knowledge of, but for others, an event that will live with them forever. Some Hmong kids don't know what their parents or grandparents had to do to refuge in America. Others beside them weep, cry, and roar, praying with their hands up high, saying, We don't want this anymore. Why was the only choice war? And the war became a secret to both man, moon, and sun. The clouds who had watched began to cry. She was too kind, too fragile for this world. They were just young boys, stuck in grown men's shoes. Run! Run. Lose Annie! Repeat! Run! Run. 
Lose the enemy, repeat. Why was your own choice war? My grandfather, a participant in the Vietnam War, a war that was looked down upon by the American people, and in the end was one of the U.S. most shamed wars. You will never hear my grandfather speak of this war. Run! Run! Lose the enemy, repeat. We weren't safe. We were left behind. All we have left now is for each other. Run! Run. Lose, Lose the enemy, enemy. repeat. They run and hide with nowhere to go. Hmong people are being forgotten. And they still do not recognize our kindness and death. And the war became a secret to both man, moon, and sun. But the clouds who had watched began to cry. My grandfather. All we have left now for each other. Run. 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 Lose the enemy. Repeat, 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 repeat. No place big enough for holding. All the tears you're gonna cry. It's hidden. No one knows. No one hears. No one listens to a forgotten soldier with no grave. Mothers, fathers, sisters, brothers, children, unmarked like our people in history, forging our way through time without a single recollection of our existence. Cause your mama's name was lonely. And your daddy's name was pain And they call you little sorrow Cause you'll never love again Our people are still being killed in the jungles of Laos and Vietnam till this day Retaliation for participation in a war that supposedly never existed The war didn't end in 1975 you ain't got no one to hold you. How long till the secret no longer cries in the depths of our souls, but can take its place on stage? You ain't got no one to care. How long till we can come together and remember openly the past that has not yet been remembered, the days that have not yet been forgotten, the war that has not yet healed? If you'd only understand, dear, nobody wants you anywhere. This me no. So go on and fly. Look me in the eyes, you know. Listen to me speak, hear my heart. The secret is out. Cesar won't drink the water. Cesar won't drink any water. Cesar won't, may never drink any water again. He believes in this fight. He believes in his struggle. He believes in his people. My fathers have lost the economic battle and won the struggle of cultural survival. And now, I must choose between the paradox of victory of the spirit despite physical hunger, or to exist in the grasp of American social neurosis, sterilization of the soul, and a full stomach. Yes, I've come a long way to nowhere, unwillingly dragged by that monstrous, technical, industrial giant called progress and Anglo success. 
I look at myself. I watch my brothers. I shed tears of sorrow. I sow seeds of hate. I withdraw to the safety within the circle of life. I am Rodolfo Corky Gonzalez. I was born in Denver, Colorado. I was inspired by the land grants movement, which sought to reclaim ancestral lands taken from the Mexican people. Where you take land, you take culture. I am a former boxer and activist. I wrote the poem, I am Joaquin, to give representation and significance to my people, the Chicano people. I have endured in the rugged mountains of our country. I have survived the toils and slavery of the fields. I have existed in the barrios of the city, the suburbs of bigotry, in the mines of social snobbery, and in the prisons of detection, and in the moth of exploitation, and in the fierce heat of racial hatred. Women were also part of the Chicano movement. I am Luz Gutierrez. I read and wrote these words in 1971 at the first National Chicano Conference in Houston, Texas. Women's willingness to work outside the home despite conflict with their husband bespeaks the material and other benefits that employment secured for them. The increasing significance of those benefits to Chicanas and the erosion of opposition to their working was reflected in the large number of Chicanas that entered the workplace after 1960. We are here, we will remain. We are here, we will remain. I am Joaquin. The odds are great, but my spirit is strong. My faith, unbreakable. My blood is pure. I'm Aztec Prince and Christian Christ. I shall endure, I will endure. We also needed representation in the classroom. My name is Salvador Castro, and I am a teacher and activist. I remind my students that we hear daily of the magnificence of America, of America democracy. But where do we find the magnificence of the Mexican people? Because when we turn to the history books, to movies, to television and music, what we see is the stereotype of the dirty, smelly Mexican with a tequila bottle in one hand and a dripping taco in the other, a serif wrapped around you, wearing a big sombrero. We now carry the water. We carry the water into the future. I shall endure. I will endure. I'm Dan, and I'm Vietnamese American. Hi, I'm Chu Yi, and I'm Hmong American. Hi, I'm Rebecca, and I am American. I'm Yi Meng, and I'm Hmong American. Hi, I'm Lily, and I am Hmong American. Hello there, everyone. My name is Mua Zhang, and I'm Hmong American. I'm Chandra and I am Hmong American. We'll start with the executive order, 9066. And on February 19th, 1942, President FDR permitted the use of Japanese internment camps after the Pearl Harbor attack. This forced approximately 127,000 Japanese American citizens to lose everything they had and to move into concentration camps. Japanese American Frank Kermasu decides to fight against the internment camps and his battle gets him into the Supreme Court. Where well, the conviction is upheld due to false information and previous evidence from the government. Showing how the internment of Japanese Americans was not justified in any way. Some time had passed since Fred Kermasu's court case. The last internment camp closed at the end of 1945 and the Civil Rights Act of 1964 prohibited racial discrimination 
in light of the African American Civil Rights Movement. Unique to the Asian American minority, their discrimination is influenced by American conflicts with foreign Asian countries. Racial discriminations towards Asians continued well after the Civil Rights Act, and Fred Korematsu is determined to bring justice to Japanese internment despite this court decision. 20 years later, Fred Korematsu visited the Northern California Federal District Court. There, Judge Patel vacated his conviction on the basis that the Japanese internment was illegal. It was because it was supported by lies and suppressed evidence. Although the U.S. Congress and Supreme Court never overruled the original 1944 court decision, the Congress did formally apologize to interned Japanese Americans in the 1988 Civil Liberties Act. 9-11, a tragic event that sparked prejudice against Muslims across America. But Fred Korematsu was one of the first to publicly call for Americans to not target Muslim Americans. Making this decision because of his experience with, with the persecution of Japanese Americans due to the bombing of Pearl Harbor. And bringing fact that the attacks were conducted by foreign-born Muslims working for Al-Qaeda. Seen in the 2016 presidential race, minorities are still being oppressed in both reality and ideology. Candidate Donald Trump, in reaction to the San Bernardino attacks by two Muslim radicals, calls for the persecution of all Muslims and seeks to prohibit Muslims from entering the United States. Historians say that history repeats itself, and the wise say to learn from our past mistakes. If Donald Trump delivers what he promises, then Japanese in turn will return to the U.S. in the form of Muslim discrimination. His and many others' ideas violate the basic laws that grant the freedom of religion, association, and equal protection, laws which any leader must uphold and defend for all Americans. Although the Asian American Civil Rights Movement can trace its origins to the human tragedy of Japanese internment, it was not until the victory of the African American Civil Rights Movement in 1964 that it was given a protected voice. And like many of those movements born at that time, it was not embodied by just one person. Unlike Fred Korematsu, Yuri Kochiyama's path to becoming a civil rights leader was not about vindicating her own individual rights. Yuri's journey began when her father was arrested the day after the Pearl Harbor attacks as a potentially dangerous person by the FBI merely because of his ethnicity. Only days before, he had been released from a, the hospital and was still gravely ill. During his captivity, he was denied medical attention, and shortly after his release, he died. Without any time to grieve, Yuri and her family were removed from everything they had ever known and placed into a horse stable where they awaited the completion of an internment camp in Jerome, Arkansas. For the next three years, they stayed there imprisoned, and upon their release, had nothing. No home to go to, no jobs, no hope. Amid that chaos, Yuri met her husband, Bill, a Japanese-American who served honorably during World War II. With nothing but the hopes of a new beginning, they moved to Harlem, New York, and lived in public housing for the next 12 years. And in the years before the Civil Rights Act, they came close with their neighbors, who were predominantly black, and recognized the common bond of being oppressed people. And in the years after the Civil Rights Act, Yuri continued to lead the way for the fledgling Asian American movement by protesting the Vietnam War and the anti-Asian sentiment that had arisen back from World War II and the Korean War. She advocated for women's rights, Puerto Rican independence, and the recognition of Japanese uh, internment. She joined Malcolm X's Organization for Afro-American Unity. And on a tragic day in 1971, it was Yuri who held Malcolm X 
as he lay dying after he was shot. Rather than be crushed by losing her close friend, this only strengthened Yuri's resolve to continue fighting for the civil rights of human beings here and abroad, peaceably. In 1976, Yuri's lifelong battle was won when President Gerald Ford issued Proclamation 4417, which stated that Japanese internment was a national mistake. And in 2005, like Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. before her, Yuri was nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize. Today, the Asian American movement is a pan-Asian movement and not revolved around an individual ethnic cause. It advocates for the rights of all Americans and not just Asian Americans. It has become the embodiment of what Yuri and Fred fought for, each in their own way. And it can be best summed as what Fred said upon his victory in federal court. I remember 40 years ago today when I was arrested as a criminal I didn't agree with that then, and I still don't. As long as my record stands in federal court, any American citizen can be arrested, imprisoned, held in concentration camps without a trial or hearing. It is up to us and all Americans to make sure that this never happens again. We are Asians. We are Fred Korematsu. We are Yuri Kochiyama. We are civil rights. We are Americans. Our voice will be heard. They have names like Barbara, Carol, Ruth, and Betty, regular all-American girl names. But they have powers, powers often hidden by the disguise of homemaker, wife, mother, or under the cloak of the low-paying job, the lack of advancement, glass ceilings. During the Second World War, Women were called by the millions to serve their country in the best way they could by taking over the important jobs that men had filled until they were called to duty overseas. Women became mechanics and bus drivers and professional athletes, welders, farmers, public servants, janitors. They worked for the men all while keeping food on the table, the kids cared for, and the home happy. Women's work. The war ends, and three million jobs are once again held by men. America is the greatest country in the world, and women can go back to enjoying life as wives, mothers, homemakers, women's work, home, family. And yet, the question, afraid to ask, afraid of what the answer might be, is this all there is? In 1963, Betty Friedan starts a revolution when she publishes The Feminine Mystique, and women realize it is not they who are incapable of doing more, but a society that had become too comfortable with the idea of what was and wasn't women's work. 1963 also marks the year that President Kennedy signs the Equal Pay Act into law, requiring that employers pay men and women the same amount of money for the same work. And yet, currently in the United States of America, women still make, on average, 79 cents to every dollar a man makes. Still, in America, in the 21st century. 1966 sees Ferdinand establish the National Organization of Women, along with Germaine Greer, Polly Murray, Shirley Chisholm, and Muriel Fox. 
They take on the enemies of pay inequity, gender and racial bias, discrimination and harassment in the workplace. Women's work. Now, the decade of the 1960s has turned America upside down, fighting a war overseas that no one really believes in. 11,000 women stationed in Vietnam, most of them nurses in combat zones. Women's work. In America, we are fighting for equality of race and gender, fighting to change every status quo, fighting to be heard. In 1963, Gloria Steinem dons the iconic costume of a Playboy bunny and seeks to expose the billion-dollar empire female exploitation built. In 1972, she launches what would become the most iconic and longest-lived of feminist writings, Ms. Magazine choosing none other than Wonder Woman to grace its first cover, a hero who emerged just after Rosie the Riveter was told to go back to the kitchen, a hero with the face of an all-American girl, powerful with a hunger for justice, strong, feminine, kind, dominating the forces of evil that sought to destroy the American values we held so dear, women's work. And now, the face of a new kind of hero, a hero of the everyday struggle, a hero with the face of a mother, a sister, a daughter, one who knows that there is something more and that women's work can be anything, even while the white male boards of corporations insist that promoting women to executive positions is impossible, as it would require building a second bathroom for the ladies that made it that far up the ladder. Glass ceilings. Perhaps if the women had offered to clean those ceilings first, or the executive washrooms, women's work. By 1973, most American women still could not have a bank account, credit, or own property under their own name. Thank goodness for husbands and fathers who could do it for them. In fact, it would be another 10 years, 1983, before a woman could have her own credit card. What a miracle then, when in 1973, a young lawyer named Sarah Weddington argued for a woman's right to choose when and how and under what circumstances she wanted or didn't want to be pregnant, the Supreme Court agreed with her. Roe v. Wade threw the women's movement into overdrive. Suddenly, women had a court-ordered mandate giving them permission to be in charge of their own bodies and lives, an idea so radical, so dangerous to what society was used to, politicians have been working to take back those rights ever since. Still, in 2016, my body, my choice, women's work, so much work. The glass ceiling cracks, opens up enough to let some light in, Women see what's possible. Let the light in. More and more, the ceiling cracks. The stars come into focus, and the universe expands exponentially to your willingness to leave behind all you know and be brave, be a hero. Your name written in the stars. Sally. In 1978, Sally Ride becomes one of the first women accepted by NASA into the astronaut program. Women's work. And Sally knows she has what it takes. She knows there is something more. Athlete, scholar, teacher, scientist, first woman in space, visionary, women's work. Now, the 1980s and the 90s give us the mommy wars, continued sexual objectification in the media, harassment and denial in the workplace. You can't break a glass ceiling without getting cut. Every revolution gets paid for by the blood and the sweat of its soldiers. And years go by, and the struggle remains. But there are gains and landmarks and brave people who know that there is something more and that equality is not just a dream, but a truth worthy of the fight. In 2016, there are more and more women in government, on the Supreme Court, running for president, the rights of women and girls is the unfinished business of the 21st century. Because still, still fighting to make equal pay, to maintain control over our bodies and our health, to be educated and respected, 
to be public servants and bus drivers and professional athletes and CEOs and caregivers and mothers and anything else we want. Women's work, so much work. Still, so much work to do, but they continue. The everyday heroes with names like Lily, Yusinat, Tyrese, Ki, Kajang, Kathy, Carolyn. The glass ceiling will break apart for good someday. Clear skies for all. Names written in the stars. Uh, hi, um, I'm Rihanna. Uh, this is Absent Narratives. Okay. Um, well, I am a playwright, a director, and an actor, um, um, and I'm also Native American. Um, well, I'm thrilled to be part of your project, Absent Narratives. Um, but you know what? I'm more excited that you guys are interested to learn about the Native American civil rights era and about the American Indian movement which was started right here in the Twin Cities. Okay, guys, so tell me, what, are you, what have you learned so far? Nothing. Nothing? Um, anyone else? I've learned that it's hard to learn about the Native Americans. Well, why, why is that? When I Googled Native American absent narratives, nothing came up. Yeah, it really is an absent narrative. It's impossible to find any information Native Americans. My teacher says that the status of Native Americans is really bad right now. And every time I see them in TV or in movies, there's really stereotypes. I don't even know if it's possible to get a real story. Uh, hold on a minute. You guys are getting a real story from me. I I'm not a stereotype. Um, <laughs> I can't believe that you guys think you cannot find out information about Native Americans. I mean, the American Indian movement started here in the Twin Cities. Yeah, you told us that one already. <sighs> okay, all right. Um, in Minnesota, tell, tell me what else you guys have learned. Uh, have, so t what, is, what have you guys learned about Native Americans? H have you been Googling it? <sighs> no, no information? You guys, come on, dig deep. What do you know that's real about Native people that's not stereotyped? Well. Your aunts, your uncles, do any of you work with Native people? Oh, my aunt's, my aunt's husband is Ojibwe. I can maybe ask him what it was like to live at the time when the American Indian Movement was happening. Okay, yes. Yeah, and and my mom works with a Native American man, and maybe he might be interested in talking with me. Right, those are great resources, a good place to start. Now, and if you look around, you can see that Native people are not invisible like you've been told. To begin with? Well, when do we get to hear about things like Wounded Knee, though? A wounded Knee? All right. Um, well, which one? Was there more than one? <laughs> yes. I don't even know what wounded knee is. Did someone like fall on the ice and hurt their knee? <laughs> <laughs> don't be ridiculous. Didn't uh, wounded knee have to do with Custer and the Battle of Little Bighorn? Um, yes, that's, but that's not the one that we're talking about. You're thinking 1891. Okay, guys, everyone else, get out your cell phone. Google wounded knee 1973. 200 followers of the American Indian Movement occupied the town of Wounded Knee on the Pine Ridge Reservation in South Dakota. It lasted 71 days while armed FBI agents and U.S. Marshals surrounded them. And why did this happen? Because of unfair treatment of Native Americans? Yes. Because of the poverty that Native Americans have been living in? Yes. Because the Indians were tired of getting kicked around? Uh, well, yes, in a nutshell. <laughs> I meant Native Americans. Are we allowed to say Indians? 
Well, you know, if you say Indians or Native Americans, what you guys are actually referring to is over 560 different tribal nations. And, and each, each nation has its own culture, its own customs, and, and their own language, right? So, so knowing this will help us understand Wounded Knee more. Okay, all right, so the American Indian Movement, it began as a response to the unfair treatment and the police brutality that was a regular occurrence on the streets of Minneapolis. And the American Indian Movement, they began to document this by using cameras, having eyewitnesses, and reporting these incidents to the newspapers, and soon, Members of the American Indian Movement were known as helpers, not just in the Twin Cities and Minnesota, but across the whole country, too. I just read that not a single treaty the U.S. government made with Native Americans was kept. Like, that kind of, that kind of explains why their status is so bad right now. It's because all their treaties were broken. Like, when a treaty is signed, it's more than just an agreement. It recognizes the identities of both nations with equal respect. Like, I was just reading about when the United States government refused to close off the Black Hills to, to white miners and settlers, and when they did that, they weren't just disrespecting natives, they were disrespecting their own words. And it was more than a hundred years before anything changed. Because of the American Indian Movement. So, how should we start this play? Okay, well, how did the incident at Wounded Knee begin? Well, it looks like there was a town hall meeting, and a woman named Gladys asked for help from the American Indian Movement. I, I actually think we should probably start with Gladys. Okay. Maybe she would say something like this. Oh, you write a monologue? Oh, okay, good job, you've been listening. <laughs> okay, um, let's see. <clears throat> oh, I like it. No more! My name is Gladys Bissonette, and for too long, I have seen my people mistreated, and for too long, I have listened to false and biased news reports. And for too long, I've seen unequal opportunities for my people. And for too long, I have seen our treaties disrespected. 370 treaties have been made, and not a single one has been upheld. We have been powerless. For many years, we have not fought any kind of war. And we have not fought any kind of battle. And we have forgotten how to fight. But the time is now to stand up against injustice. We are gathered here at Calico Hall. AIM leaders, tribal leaders, and passionate youth. And together we are strong. Together here at Pine Ridge, we can broadcast our voices across the nation. We have written letters. We have made phone calls. We have made statements to our congressmen. We asked, we begged that Pine Ridge be investigated. It never was done. We must give them something they, they can't, can't ignore. ignore. Oh, man, it's my Strong people don't need strong leaders. 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 You don't need Malcolm X or Martin Luther King Jr. telling you what to do. If you are strong, you will take action by yourself. Strong people don't need strong leaders. Fundi, that's what they call me. 
Sifundi. At least that was my nickname. Sifundi is a Swahili word that means one that passes down the craft to the next generation. Parents are educators. And no matter how small or little, that passes down to the next generation. And parents are generating education down to the next generation. The problem is some of us don't know. We don't know the power that we have, the power to change within ourselves to the next generation. And so here we are. April 1960, sit in SNCC, Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. That was my path to change. I think, no, I'd like to believe that I can make a change in my community, in my school, in the world. I can be that change. Strong people don't need strong leaders. Strong people don't need strong leaders. So the question is, what are we going to do tonight? Are we going to live in silence and needless suffering? Or we'll pass down strength, hope, and direction to the next generation? Until the killing of black men, black mother's sons become as important to the rest of the country as the killing of white mother's sons. We who believe in freedom cannot rest until this happens. Ella Baker, 1964. This work is funded in part with money from the Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund that was created with the vote of the people of Minnesota on November 4th, 2008.